Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight for the Wednesday evening Bible study. We are studying the book of Exodus and tonight we're headed for Exodus chapter 20. So I want to invite you as we always do to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 20. I'll have the text on the screen, but something can always go wrong. Don't trust me on this. I want you, if you can, to look this up in your own copy and follow along. And as always, if you have any questions or comments or concerns about tonight's class, if there's something we need to be praying about, let us know. You can send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can call or send us a text to 608-224-0274. Uh, Tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So the people have left Egypt. They are now three months into their journey to freedom as we've described it on our title slide here. And last week's study, we saw God tell Moses to have the people prepare, and they did. They followed God's instructions quite well. They set up boundaries around Mount Sinai. They consecrated themselves by washing their clothing. And so they're pretty much all ready for what God has prepared for them on this third day. And that brings us to the Ten Commandments. And before we even get to the Ten Commandments, I've kind of sometimes wondered, and I've wondered this quite a bit through the years, why ten? Why ten commandments? And in particular, why these ten? So not only why ten, but why these particular ten? And you know, we understand that God had many commandments in what we now know as the Law of Moses. Uh, Some have uh, suggested something like 613 commandments. I have no idea how legitimate that is. Uh, That seems pretty picky to me to be combing through it like that and cataloging them in that way. But whether it's over 600, it's a lot, isn't it? If we've read through those books, the first five books of the Old Testament, you know, so I've never tried to number the commandments myself, so I don't know exactly how many there were in total, but I know there were more than 10. I think we all understand that. Uh, So why have 10 singled out to write on tablets of stone? Uh, By the way, Moses was the first person to ever download a document from the cloud to a tablet, wasn't he? Oh, I hope you'll forgive me for that one. But, uh, but why ten? Why ten commandments and why these ten? And why not only two commandments? If you're going to narrow it down, why not narrow it down to two? If you remember, Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, wasn't he? And you remember the Lord's answer? The greatest commandment is to love God. And you remember the second greatest commandment? To love your neighbor as yourself. And so, you know, that, that brings us to the question, why 10 and why these 10 even more difficult? Because love God and love your neighbor, they aren't even in the big 10. Have we thought about that? You know, why isn't commandment number one, love God, and commandment number two, love your neighbor? Love your neighbor isn't even in here. Love God isn't even in here, technically speaking. Um, but here's what I'm thinking. The 10 commandments are something of a summary. They are almost, we might say, the table of contents, uh, a little bit of an abstract, a kind of a preview of what's coming, getting the big picture, the big points, with the first four of the Ten Commandments addressing the people's relationship with God, and then the final six commandments addressing their relationship with one another. And so, in a sense then, if you think about it that way, the Ten Commandments do, in fact, give instruction concerning how to love God and how to love your neighbor. So that'll be kind of an outline that we'll keep an eye on as we look at these tonight. Um, I would also point out that all of the Ten Commandments are repeated in some way or another in the New Testament, with the exception of commandment number four, and that is significant. We'll get back to that in just a moment. Uh, But we are not under the Ten Commandments today. They were only given to the Israelites. They were not given to us. And these exact commandments in this format were not given to anybody before them either. So let's jump right into it tonight with the first three commandments. And I want to do the first four together. That was my plan. Uh, But commandment number four uh, is a little more involved. So I've kind of split that one off. So we'll look at that uh, on its own here in just a moment. And I did that so we wouldn't have too much on the screen here. I know uh, you don't want the, the print to get too fine. So I was kind of wanting to do the first four and then the last six, love God, love your neighbor. Um, But we'll kind of split off the first three here at the beginning. So this is Exodus chapter 20, and let's start with verses 1 through 7. These would be the first three of the Ten Commandments. And I I don't know if they're labeled in your copy of the Bible. I know some of the the Catholic uh, translations would, uh, they number these differently. They split them up in a different way, and I think a couple here at the beginning are combined in the Catholic Bible, and the, the, I think it's the coveting commandment. Uh, has a little bit more to it, and it's kind of split in two. I'm not totally sure on that. It's been a while since I've looked into that. 
But uh, let's look at the first three. This is Exodus 20, verses 1 through 7. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Well, once again, let's notice how God starts by introducing himself as the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So he starts then with this reminder of who he is. He is reintroducing himself to the people, reminding them that he is God and that he has every right to give them a set of rules to follow. And so here it comes. And the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. And in a sense, God is jealous. We find that statement. God is a jealous God uh, several times throughout Scripture, uh, almost like a husband who doesn't want his wife being with other men. Uh, that is an absolutely okay kind of jealousy. And so God demands that he be in first place. And this concept is certainly repeated in the New Covenant. You know, we can't say that since we're not under the Ten Commandments that we can go out and worship multiple gods now. That's not what we're able to do. That's not how this works. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul was addressing this issue of eating meat that had been sacrificed to pagan idols. And some people, some new converts in particular, had a real issue with that because they just came out of that lifestyle. And, you know, others, though, they didn't have a problem with that. They understood. They knew it didn't matter. Well, in that discussion, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 through 6. He says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols... We know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. So I'm just saying that just as there was only one God under the law of Moses, uh, so also God wants us to know that he is still the only God under the new covenant as well. So just because we're not under commandment number one doesn't mean uh, that we have multiple gods today. But this commandment and the concept behind it certainly is repeated in the New Testament. Well, the second commandment I think most of us would understand is certainly tied to the first one. As God continues in this line of reasoning and he prohibits the worship of idols. In fact, the people were not even allowed to make any likenesses, nothing that would even be close to an idol. And so for this reason, the Israelites never made any statues. I don't know if you all realize that. Uh, unlike many ancient cultures in the uh, ancient world, uh, you know, we go back to Greece and Rome and, and we see all these carvings and statues of people and gods and, and all that. But the Israelites, they never really did that. But instead, if you remember the Old Testament, to memorialize something, what would they do? They would often take a pile of stones, often just, you know, one large stone from each tribe, for example, when they crossed the Jordan River, and they would just pile those up. But they never took hammer and chisel to a stone because they remember the second commandment here. Uh, they would never carve those rocks in any way. They would just pile them up, but they did that and avoided any carving or engraving to avoid violating this second commandment. Um, we should also note that God has a consequence uh, listed with this one for disobeying this commandment. If they start making and worshiping idols, God would visit iniquity on the third and the fourth generations. And based on an initial reading, I mean, some have suggested very quick, quickly, this is not fair. You know, that children or great-grandchildren uh, would suffer for the mistakes of their parents and grandparents, but that's really the way it is. And it's kind of easier for me to understand this by wondering, why didn't the consequences extend to the 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th generations? Have you asked that? I think the reason is those in the 3rd and 4th generations are often living at the same time. In other words, if, a, if an elderly man turns to idols, 
he may very well have a direct influence not only on his children, but also on the third and fourth generations who are alive when he is. So his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren would actually see with their own eyes what their grandfather or great-grandfather is doing, and they would be influenced by that. And so as a general principle here, I think we need to be careful with who and how we worship knowing that our children and our grandchildren may in fact be affected by that. But what's really amazing in this passage, even though we get hung up with that part of it, what's really amazing is that God will show his loving kindness on thousands, on anybody who obeys him. That, I mean, that's the really amazing thing in this passage. So let's not forget that part. It's very easy to focus on, wait, that's not fair in the first part. But what's really amazing is God will bless who he wants to bless and that God will bless uh, anyone who obeys him. So that's the truly good news that is connected to this commandment. The third commandment is also very closely tied to the first, as God does not allow his name to be taken in vain. They were not to use God's name in a flippant or a casual way. Uh, they were certainly not to use God's name in some kind of oath, especially an oath that they had no intention of honoring. Um, you know, if we're looking for this one in the New Covenant, it's not like a direct kind of reference, but you may consider James 5.12. James says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. And of course, Jesus said something very similar to that as well. And we could probably think of another, uh, several other passages about taking the Lord's name in vain, although it's really not stated in those exact terms. Uh, the concept of honoring God with our speech uh, certainly is found throughout the New Testament. So let's continue then with the fourth commandment. This is Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Well, let's start by noticing that the command is to work for six days and to rest on the seventh. And I know we often focus on resting on the seventh, uh, but let's not miss that God wanted his people to work for six days. I think a lot of people would kind of wish that part wasn't in the Bible, but uh, God approves of work, doesn't he? God expects his people to do stuff. He expects us to get stuff done, at least under the Old Covenant. I think that concept is uh, carried over. We'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, God is a God who works. He approves of labor. He wants us to work hard. And uh, this is where we learn that the Sabbath command is tied to creation. This is tied to God's example. So the command is based on the fact that God created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them in six days, and then he rested on the seventh. And I think this reminds us that the days in Genesis chapter 1 are literal 24-hour days. So a lot of people are trying to believe in evolution, and they're like, this is what science says today, and science is always right, of course, so therefore Genesis must be a myth. And we got to figure out a way around that. So we're just going to say day one was a gazillion billion years and day two was an eon upon eons of time. And No, um, there were six actual days. There was a, a day and night and so on. And this further proves it here um, that God created the earth and everything around it, the whole universe in six days and rested on the seventh. It is the basis of this command. And so uh, the creation account is not a myth. It is not a a summary of evolution, but the uh, God created everything in six days. He rested on the seventh. He could have made everything in one day, uh, but he didn't. He chose to spread it out over six days, and he did that, I believe, as a pattern for us. As I was growing up, my dad reminded me a number of times that the human body was designed to get more work done in six days than it could get done in seven and as human beings, um, if you're an overachiever, you know how hard it is sometimes to take a day off, to step away from your work from time to time. That's an issue with some people. And I remember my dad telling me about that. Um, there was a preacher he knew who said, uh, Satan never takes a day off, so I'm never going to take a day off as a preacher. And my dad was saying, that is an unhealthy attitude to have. You'll burn yourself out. Um, God took a day off. 
Uh, Jesus took time off to get away by himself to pray and so on. So uh, there is certainly a value, even though we don't have this direct commandment today. Uh, there is something in here that we can learn uh, about how the human body was designed. It is good to rest from time to time. Uh, so this is the basis of the Sabbath commandment. And again, this is the only one of the Ten Commandments that are not specifically repeated anywhere in the New Testament. Of course, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you know that Paul would often meet with the Jewish people on the Sabbath for the purpose of teaching them the gospel. Um, he went where the people were assembled, and that's where he met them to study and to open the word of God with them. But the early church came together for worship, not on the Sabbath, but on the first day of every week. You know, it's interesting that Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. And Jesus was also meeting with his apostles on the day of his resurrection, later that Sunday evening. So that would have been the first day of the week, as well as on the following first day of the week. So it's kind of interesting how this pattern developed from the very beginning after the resurrection. Um, the early Christians were in the habit of meeting together to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Uh, that was a, a passage that uh, Josh read for us, and I'm glad that he did, connected to the Lord's Supper a couple Lord's Days ago. Um, the early Christians were commanded, or maybe not commanded, Paul says it wasn't a command, but the example, I think, would be more accurate of the early church. Uh, they were instructed, maybe, to put money in the church treasury on the first day of every week, over in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And uh, in that passage, by the way, Paul made a point of saying, I'm not only telling you this, but I've explained this to other congregations in the area that you need to contribute to the church treasury on the first day of every week. So it wasn't some isolated event based on the culture of Corinth, but this is something that was widespread among the early Christians. So they partook of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, and they also gave of their means and collected their money on the first day of every week as well. Well, there are some people today, though, who try to say that God has told his people to honor the Sabbath and that he has always said this, going all the way back to the creation. But that is not the case at all. We have no record of the seventh day ever being honored at any point before Moses explains it in the book of, of uh, Exodus. And in fact, many years later, as the people praise God through the days of Nehemiah, it's interesting to me that they say in a prayer in Nehemiah 9.14, So you made known to them your holy Sabbath and laid down for them commandments, statutes, and law through your servant Moses. I just want us to notice from Nehemiah 9.14 that God made the Sabbath known to the people at the time of Moses. Not before Moses. The Sabbath was unknown as, a, as an enforced holiday at any point before Moses. The command was not repeated either in the New Testament. So this is the fourth commandment, and I hope we notice here how uh, the first four are focused on God. If you remember what we noted earlier, the two greatest commandments are to love God and love each other. The first four focus on the people honoring God. So the rest of the Ten Commandments will focus on relationships between the people. So let's continue then with commandments number five through ten. This is Exodus 20 verses 12 through 17. Commandments 5 through 10, Exodus 20, verses 12 through 17. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Well, commandment number five is honor your father and your mother. So we've now moved into this section where we focus on interpersonal relationships or loving one another. And as Paul points out in Ephesians 6, 1, 2, and 3, this is the first commandment with a promise. So the promise connected to this one is so that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. So the promise, according to Paul, is that your days may be long on the earth. That's how it applies to us. That's how Paul puts it. So obey your parents so your days may be long on the earth. In my mind, the opposite is also true. If you do not obey your parents, your days may in fact be short on this earth for any number of reasons. But I find it interesting that God feels so strongly about this that he puts it in the Ten Commandments. And then he also repeats it very clearly in the New Testament. Children are to obey and honor their parents. 
Uh, commandment number six is you shall not murder. And we have a number of words referring to various kinds of killing and murder. And as I understand it, the word used here is only used 47 times in the Hebrew Bible. And my understanding is that this word is not used to refer to the kind of killing done in war. It uh, doesn't refer to capital punishment, which was called for under the law. It doesn't refer to the killing of animals for food. Um, you may hear today, meat is murder, or um, cows are my friends, and I don't eat my friends, that kind of thing. That, that's not what this verse is teaching. If you don't eat your friends and cows and all that, that's your deal. That's fine. Uh, no, no shame from me. Um, but it doesn't refer to killing in self-defense. It doesn't refer to an accidental killing. Uh, but this word refers to the wanton taking of life with intentional violence. So not all killing is prohibited here. In fact, I would think there are some times when God commanded the people to kill. And we'd have to kind of study that as a, a big chunk of scriptures in the Old Testament. And, um, and, and they could do that without violating the sixth commandment. So there is, I think we would have to agree, a difference between killing and murder. You know, not just based on the word, but just the context of it. And we'd have to look very carefully at scripture to kind of sort that out. And even today, just from a practical point of view, I can think of a number of scenarios where it may be actually a sin for me personally not to kill. Um, to stop an act of violence in progress, for example, against myself or against somebody else. And so we just need to be aware of that. The command here, though, prohibits murder. So I can't be plotting how I'm going to go kill my neighbor. Um, that's what's addressed here. And the Law of Moses will certainly go on in greater detail to clarify this uh, further on, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Uh, in terms of the New Covenant, this one is definitely repeated. In Romans 13, 8 through 10, Paul says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So I hope you notice there that Paul sees this commandment as falling under the heading of You shall love your neighbor as yourself. As Jesus says in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So Jesus then raises the bar on this one, as he does with several of the others. Not only is murder wrong, but you're not even supposed to be saying evil things to the people around you. Uh, the seventh commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. Some of you may know that there was an early version of the King James Version uh, that accidentally left out the word not in this verse. And it was known as the Adulterer's Bible. And I'm fairly confident that all of those have been found and destroyed. <laughs> you don't want that getting out there. Uh, but what an embarrassment. You know, if, if somebody says, well, the, uh, the King James is, you know, the most accurate translation, we just kind of need to ask them, well, well, which one? There have been many, many, many revisions through the years, including that early edition that uh, said, thou shalt commit adultery. So don't want to follow that one. Uh, but as with the murder passage, we just talked about this, uh, about adultery this past Lord's Day in Hebrews 13:4 where fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So that's been carried over. But then Jesus also raised the bar on adultery, just as he did for murder. Remember, not only is adultery wrong, but according to Jesus in Matthew 5, 27 through 28, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So we need to be aware of that, that not only is adultery wrong, but it's even wrong uh, to look and to go down that road in your mind. Uh, the eighth commandment is, you shall not steal. This is repeated in Ephesians 4.28, where Paul says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his ha own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. So notice how Paul raises the bar, of course, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You, you not only are not to steal, but you're to get a job and go work so you can help people. Uh, that's my paraphrase of that uh, verse. One of the biggest blessings in being able to have a job and make a living 
is being able to fulfill this verse right here and to use the funds that God gives us through work to go out and help other people. Commandment number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Obviously, this is repeated, Colossians 3, 9. Paul says, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. So lying is also prohibited under the new. And then the 10th commandment is you shall not covet. To covet is to want what others have and to perhaps even obsess over it and then find ways to try to get it. And uh, that is addressed in the new covenant, 1 Corinthians 6, where the covetous are listed among those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right up there with drunkards and idolaters and the homosexuals and the sexually immoral and all of that. Covetousness is thrown in there. Um, out of all of the things that people have confessed to me as a preacher and now as an elder over the past 30 plus years, um, people have confessed some pretty serious stuff, but I cannot remember a single person coming and saying, you know, Baxter, I'm having, a, I'm having a hard time this week with covetousness. Nobody's ever confessed that. And I think not because nobody's ever done it, but I think it's one of those that is extremely deceptive and we may not realize it when we're doing it. So we need to be careful. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. All right, so these are the big ten. This is not an exhaustive list of every command by any means, but this seems to be kind of a summary of what we are to do in order to love God and love each other. Well, let's continue with Exodus 20, verses 18 through 21. Exodus 20, 18 through 21. Notice how they react. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But let not God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. As soon as God stops speaking, the people are almost overwhelmed with the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the trumpet, the sight of the mountain shaking, and they're terrified. They're keeping their distance, and they beg Moses to speak to them himself. Don't let God talk to us anymore. It's too scary. We can't handle that, and uh, we might actually die if God continues talking. Moses explains, though, God is doing this as a test. As I understand it, God is trying pretty much to scare them into not sinning. And he's making an impression here. He's showing how powerful he is. And at this point, Moses approaches the cloud. So let's conclude with the last paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 20, verses 22 through 26. Exodus 20, 22 through 26, the last paragraph tonight. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. You shall make an altar of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. Well, here at the end, we have two things. First of all, God repeats the command to make no other gods besides him. This would be a very real temptation through the years for God's people, and they'll fall to this temptation many times in the future here. But secondly, the people were to build an altar. And I find it interesting, they were to build an altar before they built a place for the altar. The altar was to be a priority. That came first. They had to sacrifice. That was number one. And I believe this might have also been the case when they rebuilt the temple. Many years later, the altar came first, if I remember correctly, when they moved back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. Number one, build an altar. Then, build a building. And uh, on this altar in the wilderness, notice they were to make it not with stairs, but with a ramp so that the priest wouldn't be exposing themselves to the people during worship as they offered sacrifices to God. This is how serious that was. Their worship was to be reverent. It was to be without distractions. The people were not to be snickering uh, as they worshiped and as they observed those sacrifices. Notice also they were not to cut any stones. 
and that I believe goes back to that prohibition on graven images and just to be sure uh, they were to use uncut stones arranged in the form of an altar. Well this brings us to the end of Exodus 20 so we now have the Ten Commandments uh, by way of summary, all ten are repeated in the New Testament with the exception of the fourth commandment, the commandment to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's not to be found under the new. Today, rather, we come together on the first day of every week, and we do that by God's command following the example of the early church. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, if we can help, if we can encourage you, something we need to be praying about, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. Or you can also call or send a text 608-224-0274 and we'd love to hear from you. Let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we worship you tonight as the great lawgiver and judge. Tonight we're thankful for your law and for your instruction. We're thankful that you've taught us, that you've warned us for our own good. As our creator, you know what's best for us and tonight we honor you for that. Thank you, Father, for giving us a new and much better covenant under which we can live today. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, our high priest. We come to you in his name. Amen.